Okay, now we'll get into the second part of chapter 19, which will be focused on the cardiac muscle. And we'll talk about electrical activity. So again, this is going to be pretty heavy lecture, a lot of physiology. So, you know, really just try to take notes and review your out, you know, make an outline, go back, review your outline, and then work some of the memorization that way. So the structure of the cardiac muscle is outlined here. It's important for us to note that cardiac muscle cells are uninucleated. Okay, uni means one nucleus. There are two major types of cardiac muscle cells. Namely, we have the myocardial contractile cells, which are about 99% of the heart muscle cells and they function to conduct impulses. And so basically they contract to pump the blood through the body. And then we have what's called the myocardial conducting cells, which are the other 1% of the heart muscle cells. And they form the conduction system of the heart. They're generally much smaller than the contractile cells, and they have a few of the myofibrils um, or filaments, we can call them, which are needed for contraction. They're capable of generating their own impulses or action potentials, and therefore we call them autorhythmic. All right, so again, the myocardial contractile cells, and then we have the myocardial conducting cells. 99% and 1% of the heart muscle cells, respectively. Now, we're going to learn about a term called cardiomyocytes, which are relatively small, and they're basically columnar shaped and they branch off. They're metabolically very active, and therefore, they possess large numbers of mitochondria, and they're rich, supplied with capillaries. These uh, cardiomyocytes possess striations because of the highly organized arrangement of the myofibrils into repeated sarcomeres. And we know from AMP1, a sarcomere is the smallest functional unit of a muscle. So we're really talking about things here on the molecular and cellular levels right now. Cardiac muscle tissue possesses what we call inner calcated discs, which is where the plasma membranes of two adjacent cardiac muscle cells are extensively intertwined, and basically they bound together by gap junctions, which again, we learned about gap junctions in AMP1. These connections are gonna help stabilize the relative positions of the adjacent cells. And this also allows for direct electrical, chemical, and mechanical connection between the two muscle cells so that the cardiac muscle cells act as an enormous single cell, basically. This ability to behave as a single coordinated unit, we call a functional system, or in scientific terms, a functional sictium. Now, damaged cardiac muscle cells have extremely limited abilities to repair themselves or to replace the dead cells via mitosis. So new replacement cells don't function at the same level as the original cells. It's important to note that typically the old cells are replaced with scar tissue. The cardiac muscle cells are going to contract and they last longer than skeletal muscle fiber contraction because it's primarily due to the differences in the membrane permeability. Calcium channels remain open in the cardiac muscle cells for an extended time which results in a prolonged refractory period. So here we get into the conduction system of the heart. For lecture and for lab, I would say that I'd have a tendency to test this more than I would the first slide, which is, you know, which as you know, is very heavily on the molecular and cellular level. But this conduction system is really, really important to know. It's important that you know that it's a network of myocardial conducting cells. Again, we learned the myocardial conducting cells are about 1%, and they're responsible for initiating and distributing the stimulus to be contracted. The cardiac muscle tissue contracts on its own, even in the absence of neural or hormonal stimulation. So even without the nervous system necessarily working heavily or the endocrine system, the heart muscle is contracting on its own.
So the important parts of the conduction system are as follows. We have an SA node, also known as a sinoatrial node. And that's embedded, as you can see, in the posterior wall of the right atrium. It's near the entrance of the superior vena cava. The electrical impulse generated by this cardiac pacemaker is then distributed by the other cells through the conducting system. So if there's normal conditions, this SA node generates an action impulse or electrical impulse of 75 beats per minute. Without the nervous or endocrine control, once again, the SA node would initiate a heart impulse of slightly more. So we would be looking at approximately 80 to 100 beats per minute. And we'll get more into that uh, in, a, in a following section. The next important part of the conduction system of the heart is the internodal pathways. All right, so looking closely at this diagram, you can see the SA node that we just talked about. And then you can start to see some of the internodal pathways as well. These distribute the contractile stimulus to the atrial muscle cells as the impulse travels toward the ventricles. And we're going to look at this whole process in one after I kind of get through talking through the information. Then we have what we call the atrioventricular node, also known as the AV node, which you can also see pictured here. This node is located at the junction between the atria and the ventricles. So as I kind of talk through these, try to locate and follow these items on your own using the picture. So the AV node delivers the stimulus to what we call the AV bundle, which you can also see here. Okay, another word for the AV bundle is the bundle of HIS, bundle of his. So the AV bundle or the bundle of his is located with the interventricular septum. And we can say that serves as the electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. This bundle is gonna lead to the right and left bundle branches. So if you continue to follow the pathway here, you can see that this bundle leads to the right and left bundle branches down here. So the right and left bundle branches extend toward the apex of the heart. And then basically they turn and fan out <clears throat> deep to the endocardial surface. The left bundle, which serves as the massive left ventricle is larger than the right branch or the right bundle branch. And then we have what are called perginky fibers which are the final link in this distribution network of the conduction system. And they're responsible for depolarization of the ventricle myocardial cells that trigger the actual ventricular contraction. And as we learned in AMP1, we have depolarization incurring when the sodium ion channels are opening. Now that we've talked about the basics of the conduction system of the heart, Let's talk a little bit more about membrane potentials and general ionic movement. So we learned in AMP1, and we've been talking here about impulses and action potentials. It's important to note that these action potentials that we know about at this point, that they're considerably different between the cardiac conductive cells and the cardiac contractile cells or contractive cells. As far as the cardiac conductive cells go, they do not have a stable resting potential. There's a normal and slow influx of the sodium ions that we talked about that are causing the membrane potential to rise slowly. So that membrane potential is going from an initial value of about negative 60 millivolts up to about negative 40 millivolts, which is the threshold for the conductive cells. Upon reaching that threshold, the spontaneous depolarization would occur. Now, we have a little bit more of a focus on calcium ion channels here when we're dealing with the heart. The calcium ion channels open and the calcium enters the cell, which further depolarizes it at a more rapid rate. So we have the influx of sodium ions. And now what happens with the heart is calcium ion channels also open to help further depolarize it from the negative 40 millivolts. And it gets it to reach 
about a rate of positive five millivolts by the time that process is done. When it's at approximately plus five in terms of the millivolts, the calcium ion channels then close. And then finally, we have potassium ion channels open. And that allows for an outflux of the potassium, because remember, the cell is full of mostly potassium. So when there's an outflux of potassium, that results in repolarization, or sometimes we call that hyperpolarization. And then when the membrane potential reaches negative 60 millivolts, the potassium channels close, and once again, the sodium ion channels would open. So we have a loop that occurs from start over to step six, and then back to start, which is when we get back to approximately negative 60 millivolts, and that's when the ventricular vent uh, contraction would begin again. I'm sorry, that's where the ventricular contraction happens and then where the process begins again, because one here would represent the start of a new conduction cycle. So at one, we're back to the initial value of negative 60 millivolts. And then we run through that same process I just described again. At step six, the ventricular contraction begins again and then we're back to step one, and then the cycle goes through. Now, if you'd like to see an animation of the EKG, which is a really big part of the cardiac cycle, the electrocardiogram, which is a very common test in a physician's office in the hospital as well, you can look at the tutorial and animation of that. That's also very interesting, and we'll use a lot of similar vernacular to what we're talking about. Okay, so here's a little bit more about what we just discussed. Sometimes we'll look at action potentials in terms of graphs. And it was the same thing in AMP1. You can look at it in terms of a graph. You can look at it in terms of a picture. So really important, know this process in terms of the action potential in the cardiac conduction cell. That's, that would be a popular item to appear on a test. Now let's look at the action potential in cardiac contractile cells. So as far as this goes, there's a rapid depolarization followed by what we call a plateau phase and then a repolarization. So the contractile cells account for the long refractory periods required for the cardiac muscle cells to pump that blood effectively before they're capable of firing again for a second time, and then to pump the blood again, and then to fire again a third time. Those are what the contractile cells are gonna really focus in on. So the contractile cells are gonna demonstrate a, sta a stable resting phase of approximately negative 80 millivolts. So you can see between both types of cells we've talked about, the conductive and the contractive, we're right around what we learned in AMP1 is like negative 70 millivolts being the average. Once again, for the um, conductive cells, we start off with an initial value of negative 60 millivolts. For the contractile cardiac cells, we start out with an initial resting value of negative 80 millivolts approximately. Now that's for the atrial cells. Sometimes we could even say negative 90 millivolts for the ventricular cells. But let's just go through this process so that way we're all on the same page. For the contractile cells, when they're stimulated by an action potential or a nerve impulse, we have a voltage-gated channel that opens. We have a rapid depolarization beginning, raising the membrane potential. And that membrane potential has the ability to go up to about positive 30 millivolts when the sodium channels close. All right, so again, this happens very quickly with the contraction. And we can bring that action potential all the way up to about positive 30 millivolts, which is about when the sodium ion channels close. And then we have the plateau phase occur in which the membrane potential declines slowly because of the opening of the slow calcium channels. And then the calcium enters the cell while some potassium channels open, allowing potassium to exit the cell. All right, but this part happens slower. We call it a plateau phase. And then once the membrane potential reaches approximately zero, the calcium channels close, the potassium channels open, and then potassium continues to exit the cell and we have that repolarization or hyperpolarization. 
So the membrane potential is going to continue to drop until it reaches resting levels again. At that point, the potassium channels will close and the cycle will repeat. So what I just described, you can see depicted here. You can see the phase that happens very quickly from your negative 80 or even negative 90 millivolts, very quickly to positive 30, where it hits the plateau phase that I just described. And just for practice, you can kind of try to maybe replicate what I just said to follow the pattern of the action potential in the cardiac contractile cell. So once again, how do we monitor cardiac conduction? Well, we use what's called an electrocardiogram, also known as an ECG or EKG. Now the appearance of the EKG is gonna vary with the placement of the monitoring electrodes. Another word for the monitoring electrodes that you can see depicted on the diagrams here are leads. So we can also call our monitoring electrodes leads. There are distinct waves which are produced during a typical EKG. So these waves are called the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. All right, so you wanna put that in your notes. Again, we have the P wave, P for Peter. Then we have the QRS complex, and then we have the T wave. So let's talk about each of those. So the P wave, which you can see here, is a small wave that corresponds to the depolarization of the atria and it triggers the contraction of the atria. So if we're missing the P wave in our EKG, that would suggest that our SA node that we talked about has failed. So if the sinoatrial node is not working properly, if it's failing, we could be missing that P wave. So if it's failing, what does that mean exactly? Well, so there's something wrong with the ability of the atria to spread that electrical impulse, that action potential, which is generated by the SA node. It's not working properly. Then with the QRS complex that I mentioned, which you can see here, that appears as the ventricles depolarize. It's a relatively strong electrical signal because we know the ventricles are very, very massive. And so therefore it's gonna produce a large wave. These ventricles begin contracting shortly after the peak of the R wave. So you can see we have Q and then we have a peak at the R and then we have S. So because the AV node sends electrical impulses to the ventricles, changes in the appearance of the QRS complex could suggest that there's a problem with the AV node. So in previous slides, we learned about the AV node, the atrioventricular node, right, which we know is located at that junction between the atria and the ventricles. There could be a problem with the AV node. So a lot of times, what we would call that in English terms is like some sort of heart block. All right, the electrical impulses aren't getting to the ventricles properly. And so there's some sort of heart block, or we can say some sort of pathology with the AV node. All right, and then the final one that I mentioned there that's really important here in a typical EKG is the T wave. All right, you can see the T wave depicted here. Okay, the T wave is a small wave and it corresponds to ventricular repolarization or sometimes we say hyperpolarization. It's a separate wave. It reflects the atrial repolarization and it's not very apparent because it occurs while the ventricles are depolarizing and therefore, sometimes it's masked a little bit by the QRS. All right, one of the things I want to point out to you without getting into too much detail is that we have what we call a PR interval, or we could say PQ interval, and then we have a QT interval. All right, so we have P to Q or P to R, and then we have Q to T. And so why are those relevant? Well, if the PR interval 
reaches a certain level, it can, Im it can indicate damage to the AV node. All right, if the QT interval increases at a high level, it can be a strong indicator that the person's at risk for a heart attack. It can also suggest uh, VTAC, which the full term for that is ventricular tachycardia. If we have an elevated ST interval, so if we have an elevation when we look specifically from S to T, in three of the leads, and again, without getting into too much detail, if three of the leads are showing that elevation, like that abnormal elevation, we have what's suggested to be a heart attack in the form of a STEMI, which can be really serious. That person needs to get to the cath lab right away if they're not already there. All right, so again, we can point to certain pathologies based on what we see in this electrocardiogram, again, also called an EKG or ECG. So that's my little spiel on the EKG. You'll want to be familiar with the P waves, the QRS, and the T wave. Okay, here's a look at some normal EKGs. And then a little bit more on abnormalities regarding the EKG. Some abbreviations that you may hear in the field. Somebody might not say the full atrial fibrillation. AFib is the abbreviation. Ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. Ventricular fibrillation, VFib. We have various degrees of heart blocks. Somebody has an artificial pacemaker, as the description shows. That pacemaker device is implanted subdermally, all right, just below the collarbone. So there's a tiny wire called the lead, and it's placed from the device to the inside of the ventricular wall. If you've taken a BLS course, you know about CPR and also AEDs. The AED is the Automated external defibrillator. Okay, these can be programmed for you to turn the device on and follow the prompts. They can also be semi-automatic. There's different versions of the AED. There's pre-hospital and in-hospital defibrillators, and they vary in terms of how the clinician operates them, depending on the model and the make and the unit that you're using. As you can see here, the paddles are more commonly used in hospital settings. And that concludes my lecture for part two of chapter 19. Let me know if you have any questions.